Great. So uh, let's make a start. I, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute uh, at King's College London, and it's a real pleasure for me to host this event this evening, focused on Professor Selina Todd's excellent book, uh, which I have here, Snakes and Ladders, the Great British Social Mobility Myth. I always trip over that, Selina, when, I, when I'm saying it, but uh, uh, really excellent book. Um, so in the book, uh, Selina draws on hundreds of personal stories. Uh, to reveal the hidden history of how people have really experienced social mobility, including the unsung heroes in creating space for people to move up, but also raising deep questions about the claims around social mobility and that in particular there's always a just reward for hard work and ambition. Um, and that perfectly reflects the theme of our work at the Policy Institute on inequality meritocracy and mobility. And for our partners in this event series, our excellent partners in this event series, uh, the Fairness Foundation, which is a new initiative that's seeking to change the terms of the debate about fairness um, in the UK. Uh, Selina is Professor of Modern History at St Hilda's College, Oxford, and Snakes and Ladders um, has had huge praise, uh, making it onto a number of best books of the year um, lists. And I've also got a, a deep interest in it personally because of the, the framing around generations is my deep interest in generations. I really enjoyed that cohort-based framing to try to understand how we've got to where we are now, but also uh, a keen eye on how history has, has evolved. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing her outline of a book, which we'll start with at the beginning of this session for around uh, 15 minutes from Selena. And then we have a brilliant panel um, to discuss some of the themes that this will bring up. And I, I'll introduce them all now and unfortunately quite briefly because we've only got an hour for this session. It's going to be a really rich discussion, I'm sure. Uh, so first up, we'll have Lee Elliott Major, who is um, Professor of Social Mobility at the University of Exeter. Exeter. Then we've got uh, Halima Begum, who is uh, Chief Executive and Director of the Runnymede Trust. Um, and uh, finally, we'll have Adam Swift, who's Professor of Political Theory and Political Philosophy at uh, UCL. Uh, and then after that, we'll have time for questions from um, the audience. We've already had a few submitted, but do put your questions in the Q&A uh, function on Zoom and getting in early is good. We've got a lot of attendees um, and we will likely have relatively limited time. So I'll pass, given that, pass straight over to Selena to give a, uh, an outline. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the invitation and thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I'd really like to thank the other panelists um, for giving up their time and thoughts today. I really look forward to hearing from you. Um, so today, social mobility is a synonym for fairness and meritocracy in many Western societies. And um, as Bobby said, my book is subtitled The Great British Social Mobility Myth. And that's really the biggest myth of social mobility that my research seeks to explode. Before turning to the arguments that I make, though, let me tell you something about the focus of the book. Snakes and Ladders is about the experience of social mobility across a number of different generations from the late 19th century to the present. And I took that experiential focus because we know quite a lot about the statistical picture of social mobility, but we know far less about how it is, how it is and has been experienced, both by those who are upwardly and downwardly mobile and by those who don't experience mobility, but live in a society that suggests that going up the ladder is a good thing to, to aspire to. Statisticians have shown us that at least half the British population was socially mobile throughout the period that I cover. They've also revealed a truth inconvenient to and avoided by many of those politicians who argue for greater social mobility, that downward mobility was as significant as upward mobility in many eras, because we have so little room at the top, there are only ever a certain number of niches at the top to fill. The period often invoked by politicians as evidence that we can and should increase social mobility, by which they tend to always mean upward social mobility, is the so-called golden age of the decades immediately after the Second World War. The generation born between the late 1930s and early 50s were more likely to experience upward mobility and less likely to be downwardly mobile than any generation before or since that I've studied and I'll return to the reasons for this shortly. Now, I accept this statistical picture, but it does pose some problems. 
First, mobility data aren't very good on sex. They don't provide as accurate a picture of women's lives as they do of men's. That's partly because it's harder to track women's occupations and pay, which tend to be the two variables that statisticians who look at mobility use between generations. And many social scientists have taken a household approach to social mobility, which in effect uses a husband's or father's occupational income as a proxy for a woman's social class. Now, that's understandable, given that sex discrimination means that women have tended to earn less and have access to fewer occupations than men. But it's hidden some important trends in women's employment and some barriers to their mobility. And it also shows, I think, the limits of taking a purely statistical approach um, to this matter. In effect, with statistics alone, we can't have an accurate picture of women's experiences. And that really matters, not only because women are more than half the population, but also because my research backs up other studies which have shown that women's mobility has a profound effect on their families. For example, because women have tended to be the primary carers of children, mother's educational level has had a greater influence on their children's subsequent educational performance and mobility than fathers. The statistical approach also can't fully account for migrants who may come from societies with very different occupational structures to that in Britain. My book shows that the myth of the upwardly mobile migrant is just that. Migrants who have done well in Britain very often come from families which were in something akin to a middle class back home. They use educational and financial capital to restore themselves to a similar level in Britain, although this is hard work and often takes two or three generations. That project often places a great deal of pressure on migrant children to succeed in a society which, sadly, um, has often met their aspirations with racism. I'll return more generally to the pressure that upwardly mobile can pose before, before closing. Finally, occupations change over time. In recent decades, we've seen a range of white collar and professional workers experience a decline in security and status. So being a manager, for example, means something very different depending on when and where you live. So that's why increasingly many social scientists have been calling for more studies of the experience of social mobility, and it's why I wanted to undertake such a study. Now, I used hundreds of personal testimonies, and my major source base came from uh, the Mass Observation Archive, which is based down in Sussex. Um, Mass Observation was established in the 1930s to undertake what they called an anthropology of ourselves. But I've tended to use more the records that it's collated since its revival in the 1980s. Mass Observation has a self-selected panel of volunteer writers who number about 800 people from across the UK, um, slightly weighted towards women and weighted towards the middle class. Now that sample is really useful for a study of social mobility because many of them experienced mobility themselves. So in 2016, I worked with Mass Observation to send out one of their quarterly directives that they send out each year to, to volunteers, asking them to write about their experiences of social mobility and their family's experience of it and also what they thought was meant by social mobility and how the idea and policy rhetoric around social mobility had affected them and how they reacted to it. Um, and their uh, very rich testimonies uh, form the backbone of much of the book. So I'll just give you a taste of some of my findings. Firstly, upward social mobility was not the result of individual aspiration and hard work as politicians sometimes like to claim. Instead, it was more often the achievement of state intervention, when that intervention considered human welfare at least as important as economic expansion. Greatest upward mobility, statisticians have shown us, occurred in the decades directly after the Second World War, when the state massively expanded its bureaucracy, creating new jobs in, for example, teaching to service new schools that were built, and nursing uh, to staff the new National Health Service. The state also subsidized industry in a manner that encouraged the creation of new jobs, including at middling and senior strata. In turn, these jobs enabled many people to experience upward mobility. 
Mobility tends to occur then as a result of the expansion of employment rather than through established professions opening up to new recruits. So the appearance of upward mobility is not necessarily a sign of a more equal or meritocratic society. To give a couple of examples of what I mean. In the Second World War, the civil service, which until then had tended to recruit at its middling and senior echelons from an elite of Oxbridge graduates, expanded as a result of new wartime demands and thus gave a generation of lower middle class men and some women the chance to rise through the ranks. After the war, when those new demands disappeared, the civil service shrank back to its older pre-war recruitment strategies. But in the 1950s and particularly the 1960s, the expansion of higher education enabled some working class men to enter the professions as university lecturers. However, they tended to go into newer subjects like the social sciences rather than older established ones like my own history and tended to find work in the newer universities that were just opening and needed staff, not in older established institutions like Hawkesbridge or the University of London. What this reminds us is that groups on the highest rungs of the social ladder have tended to cling to their perch and fend off newcomers. I argue in the book that rather than castigating them for doing so, we should understand this as a perfectly reasonable strategy to secure one's own and one's children's futures in eras when downward mobility can mean loss of income, property, and potentially poverty. We do better to critique the insecurity and great inequality between social classes, which can encourage such opportunity hoarding. Selective and vocational education are often cited as a spur to social mobility. It was the case right through the period that I've examined that education could help somebody to get on. In post-war Britain, for example, children who attended selective grammar schools were more likely to get white collar work and professional jobs than those who did not. However, employment expansion meant that by the 1960s, children from the non-selective schools, the vast majority of Britain's youth, were also likely to enter white collar jobs, though they had a much harder time getting into university or the professions. And they showed that they were able to do such work very well. Later, an expansion of adult education in the 1970s enabled some of that generation who had failed the 11 plus and not got a grammar school education to enter higher education where they also did well. As these children's success showed, selective education tends to underrate potential. The post-war state also invested in vocational education, notably in technical high schools after 1945. But by the 1960s, these were being phased out because the skills they taught were becoming obsolete. Vocational education tends to be based on the labor market as it is, rather than the labor market of the future. It can work against rather than for innovation. By contrast, non-selective and adult education emerge as key drivers of upward mobility in my research. In the first third of the 20th century, the British labour movement massively expanded adult education through the Workers' Educational Association and labour colleges like Ruskin in Oxford. These organisations educated thousands of working class people including many who went on to become trade union officials and leaders and labor politicians. Later in the 1970s, another expansion of adult education enabled many women to leave manual work or to get into the job market for the first time, taking up professional work in teaching, librarianship and medicine. Importantly, the education that mattered was not vocational. It was education in the broadest sense that gave people a chance to explore new interests, meet different ideas and broaden their horizons. Another finding is that men's upward mobility has often been at the expense of women's. In working class households, priority for education and training was often given to sons or after the Second World War to husbands. This is particularly true in eras, in eras of economic in insecurity. Daughters and wives provided crucial support by earning money and looking after these male students. It wasn't the case that the entire family benefited equally from these men's subsequent mobility. Very often, men retained a large portion of their increased income for themselves, 
rather than contributing it to their household. And in families where brothers received an education while their sisters did not, these young men were far more likely to experience upward mobility in adult life than their sisters. Men's upward mobility has been at the expense of women in another way too. Very often, upwardly mobile men have displaced women. For example, when the BBC was founded in 1922, Lord Reith, the first director general, initially wished to staff it with male Oxbridge graduates. But these young men preferred less risky alternatives like the civil service and Reith was obliged to recruit women. Their hard work meant that by the mid thirties, the BBC was no longer seen as a risky venture by male graduates, but instead an attractive place to work. As male Oxbridge graduates began to join up, the corporation instituted a marriage bar, which effectively barred all but a few women from any chance of a senior post. Later in the 1960s and 70s, men entering universities as university lecturers tended to enter departments which had previously been staffed by women. Social work and social science were key examples. These men were able to marginalize women who had focused in their research on such matters as the welfare of women and children by asserting the greater contemporary relevance of their areas of study, one of which was social mobility. That example reminds us that social mobility is just one way of thinking about how, to, how our society works and how it should work and how we can get it to work better. I argue that while upward mobility has brought economic, social and personal benefits to those who have experienced it, many of them have also experienced isolation, huge stress and sometimes guilt about those that they've left behind or been unable to help as much as they might have liked. Moreover, those who experience downward mobility, often forgotten in the stories that politicians like to tell, or who are not upwardly mobile in periods where mobility is presented as a measure of personal success, tend to suffer greatly, both economically and emotionally. Today, advocates of social mobility, what I call the social mobility industry, present these negative experiences as a deficit of the individuals concerned. They call for greater education in middle-class etiquette, public speaking and so on, so that ascending the ladder is an easier task and brings with it fewer cultural difficulties. But what I try to argue is that those skills are no guarantee to upward mobility. In fact, they reinforce the idea that the only values worth having are those of an elite which has stripped the world of its natural resources and hoarded wealth. We need better values and different ways of living, not more of the same. It doesn't have to be this way, by which I mean we don't simply have to ask how we incre increase social mobility in this society, a question which by its very nature assumes that our society has to be unequal, that only a few can get to the top. My book includes examples of movements and individuals who envisaged a different kind of society. They include the early 20th century labour movement, which believed that universal education could and should assist in universal uplift rather than in creating a dog-eat-dog -dog world where only a few do well. Later in the 1970s, the socialist and feminist movements did incredible work in expanding adult education and in expanding some professions. For example, the Law Centre movement provided some working class women and men with the chance to qualify as solicitors. Feminists also argued strongly that we should rethink how we value labour. Why, they asked, should bank managers be paid more than cleaners? I think that as the world melts around us and the pandemic wreaks most havoc on the poorest in our society, the questions that those feminists posed are well worth revisiting. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much. You know, what a, a lot of ground we covered there. Um, uh, thank you for that. Just a reminder to people to put your questions in the Q&A, but I'm gonna go straight over to Lee um, for your reflections on that, please. Thanks, Selena. It's, it's a real pleasure to uh, respond to you. And, and, and it's unusual. You know, not every academic is a good writer. And, and I, you know, it, it is a, the book is a well written. And I just wanted to say that up front because I have to read a lot of books and it was a real pleasure uh, to read. I also really welcome the fact that you bring different perspectives to the social mobility literature, 
as you say, and as, as you know, I, I'm more associated with the statistical analysis of social mobility and one of, well, lots of weaknesses in that. And that has been one, as you say, sex, also ethnicity as well, actually. They're, if you look at the studies, um, a lot of them are based on, on white males, basically. Um, so I do I do recognise that as a huge weakness of the, of the literature historically. And I do hope that going forward, we can um, have richer studies that, that look at uh, those characteristics um, from a statistical standpoint at, as well. I was trying to sort of think about what the, what the implications were for contemporary debates of, 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 of your book. And I think it does, it's a very timely book in, in that, you know, um, if, we, if we look at absolute social mobility rates, whether you, whether you talk to the sociologist or the economist, this is one of the things they do agree on, is that that upward uh, social mobility rates that you spoke about, that seems to be in, in decline to some extent. So um, there is more downward mobility happening for, for recent uh, generations. Um, if you look at social class um, mobility and certainly uh, millennials growing up now are likely on, on average to earn less than their parents' generation. That's quite unusual since the war. So we are entering into a phase where I think the debates that you're raising are going to become more to the fore in public debate. The debates, uh, Bobby, as, as you said, really about fairness, uh, I think, will, will, will become... Um, more prominent. Um, I, I, I think I'd also agree that if, if we are going to talk about social mobility, I'm very conscious of my, my title is Professor of Social Mobility here, um, but anyone who's serious about social mobility, any politician, any, any academic, I think has to concede that inequality is incredibly important for social media. So, so, you know, in just in mechanical terms, if the rungs of the ladder are wider apart, it's harder to climb, right? So, so anyone who argues that, that it, it, you can't, um, uh, you know, that, that you shouldn't tackle inequality, I think is never going to solve the issues of social mobility. Um, I'm, I, think that, I think that's right. Um, where I might differ a little bit, I think, uh, from Selena is maybe I don't know actually on this it would be interesting to hear back from this but I I feel that while I totally agree that we need to think about more equality and and also um, by the way I think you made some very good points around the sort of the narrow race that we're all meant to engage with uh, and some of the education debates that I'm involved in um, really is about trying to value vocational and creative talent as as next to academic talents and we have a very narrow narrowly defined academic system and i think you're absolutely right there is this sort of um you know the the, the, the elites will talk about um improving sort of meritocracy but it, it, it it's a sort of uh, it, it feels like you know when i talk to young people across the country who are aren't doing so well at school I feel I feel like a lot of it is actually a rational response to this race that they're never able to win. So I, I sort of I, I think there's there, there is something definitely I, I can see in that argument. And I think we do need more debates about how we have wider values that value people in, in different ways. So I agree with that. Um, where I differ a bit, I think, is that I am trying to have a pragmatic stance on this. So I will engage in in, in debates about how we improve opportunities in some way so you know recently I was um, looking to reform how we use personal statements for university admissions it's just a small thing but there I guess I'm sort of getting involved in opportunity debates rather than maybe equality debates so uh, I suppose and maybe I'm just a defeatist in this I feel that the political regime whether you look at the opposition or, or the current government is wedded to this concept flawed as it may be. Um, so I, I suppose I feel like I'm sort of trying to battle this on, 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 two, on two grounds, arguing for equality, but at the same time fighting these other battles. Um, I'm conscious of time, Bobby, but a, a few other just reflections. I think for me, you know, social mobility underneath this, for me, is a principle of choice. Your background shouldn't, in my view, determine what you choose to do in life. 
it shouldn't be making presumptions about what what is success and what you should do. And I think, again, the book is very good on that. There are examples of people who are downwardly mobile. I'm very happy with it, by the way. <laughs> you know, um, you can choose not to have a, a high power job that you're going to spend all hours doing. And I do know some people that have chosen that. Um, so. I don't think we necessarily need to think of that being down mobile as necessarily negative. Um, but I think the thing that worries me the most, I suppose, in, in terms of the, the contemporary debates, and I'll, I'll stop on this, is, is, is those people around the country that I speak to that say to me, Lee, I'm not interested in moving to Manchester or London, or they're not interested in that sort of um, narrative of the rags to riches sort of version of social mobility. They basically want a decent life a decent job in the places they live. And that is the overwhelming feedback I get. So I think for me, that should be the focus of our debates. Um, and that is about social mobility, but it's not about that sort of very narrow um, sort of rags to riches uh, uh, narrative that, that we hear about a lot in, in the press. I'll stop there, Bobby. There's loads more I can say, uh, but those, those are some reflections. That's excellent. That's really good. And it connects so many things, um, including questions from the audience, which we'll come back to about geography. Um, that's definitely a key theme, but it also reflects a great discussion we had between Michael Sandel and Adrian Wildridge about how do you imagine these types of systems and, and the and how do you get it to work uh, for more with very different perspectives on on, on that between Michael and, and Adrian. Um, so, I, Selena, if you just hold any response, I will come to you to get responses to the panel, but I do want to hear from others. So, Helena, um, I think you're great to hear from you. Thank you, Bobby. Um, really, really interesting to hear about Selena's uh, book and the incredible insights and, and to hear, please, your response as well. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that um, I have played a specific game called Snakes and Ladders and uh, not the one that everyone's played. But when I used to work in the Lego Foundation, we used to um, go into practice sessions where we play a game and uh, essentially a game that we made up, which was around Snakes and Ladders. And each um, player would be given a set of uh, characteristics about their lives and, and that would then determine um, when the dice was rolled and how each player then moved along in the game. And obviously a lot happened there. Some people with a lot of wealth tended to do well and kept moving faster. And some people with uh, disadvantage tended to go slower, but then there'd be certain points in that game where they actually leapfrogged as well. So, so the game kind of tended to make you think a little bit about um, you know, opportunities, disadvantages, leapfrogging, all sorts of things that can have and happen. But the one thing was clear was that it wasn't individual success that made you cross the finishing line. There was a whole set of other things that happened. You know, if you happen to be living in Nepal, an earthquake probably happens. So, so I guess I'm, I'm starting with, with that thought in my mind, which is that, you know, there's a set of discourses that hold um, a debate around individual aspirations, you know, however hard you work hard or however hard you study, you will do well. And it is kind of true, you know, some of it is true. But on the other hand, you know, if we ask the question, um, you know, a lot of young people these days are finding it hard to get their first job. Is it that they're simply not studying anymore? Or is it that, that there is something systemically going on that's making it much harder? So, so in this sense, Lena, I agree with your analysis in that, that kind of over focus on individual aspiration of success actually hides quite a lot of the structural factors that may be at play. And you had this example of uh, the hidden experiences of women in the workplace and you gave a historical trajectory there. I could relate that experience to race and ethnicity quite clearly. Um, you know, lived experiences of racial minorities in any context is often hard to talk about, but it's a lot easier to draw the analogy with women in households or women at work. And then you, then you get a sense of what that conversation is about. And as you said, statistics can only take you so far because it doesn't really dig deep into the, the experiences and lives of real people. Um, so I really, really kind of agreed with you there and it resonated. And I also um, found it quite interesting when you talked about um, upwardly mobile migrants, of course, um, and I agree with your analysis. Um, I would also go a bit further than, than where you, you stopped, which was to suggest not only is that characterization 
um, not right, it's not accurate, for example, but there's a certain suggestion that, you know, once you are focused on the upwardly mobile migrant, there are some minorities, for example, who are quote unquote a bit lazy, not as hard working, and that's really dangerous because, you know, it can't be the case that uh, British Indians or British Chinese communities are, are so hard working, so they, therefore they are the deserving model minority, whereas British Bangladeshis or Black Africans um, who are not so, doing so well in terms of outcomes, it must be something to do with those communities. So I think there is something dangerous there. And um, if you recall, um, the government's commission on ethnic disparities, which was chaired by Dr. Tony Sewell, quite a lot of the tropes in that commission tended to go back to those individual aspirations and individual values that allow certain communities to be successful and others not to be. And of course, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot wrong with that because we stigmatizing some communities and also suggesting that success and failure is down to the individual level. Um, so I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I think there's also something about um, looking at downward mobility, as Lee was saying, it's certainly on the rise. Um, and again, what, what's causing that downward mobility if it's not through choice? It's actually a lack of choice, isn't it? I mean, those of us who make the choice to, 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 to be less better off, and that's a privilege in many ways. For most people, it's not a choice. So we, we need to understand why that's happening. And I suppose I'd be arguing for um, a greater role uh, of the state in wanting to level the playing field. Because one thing games teach you, or that, that game that I described, Snakes and Ladders, and the way I played it, which is, I think, the kind of analogy in your book is that we're not in a level playing field. Um, in a more humane setup, in a more humane society, I think we'd want to level the playing field. And, you know, we've had a lot around leveling the playing field at the moment, but that's been discussed in terms of access to jobs in certain parts of the country where um, there hasn't been long term development. But actually, leveling the playing field is more than geography. It's actually about looking at the kind of barriers in place for certain groups of people that continue to face barriers. And we know who these groups are. Um, so yeah, leveling the playing field is, is part of that discourse around social mobility, because social mobility tends to then become a fallacy. Because if you don't level the playing field, it's essentially saying that you know success or failure is down to an individual or a family or a particular person, rather than how do we make society fairer? And of course, I use the phrase fairer, not meritocracy, because there are all sorts of uh, challenging connotations behind meritocracy. You gave a historical overview of the civil service and the way in which the civil service was built on a certain set of values. Of course, meritocracy was one of those values. You also highlighted that the civil service tended to have values, borrow values from the very top of society. Well, that is meritocracy. And surely a focus on meritocracy these days in relation to social mobility is now misplaced and perhaps even irrelevant. I'll stop there. Excellent, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, Halima. And again, so many of the themes <clears throat> from this series overall being reflected in the sense of uh, the inevitability, almost inevitability of sense of humiliation among the user, uh, losers in this and hubris among the winners in this type of meritocratic framing. It's um, really interesting. So again, if you can hold your thoughts, Selena, till uh, we hear from Adam. Adam. Thanks, Bobby. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this book, Selena. Thanks very much. Um, it's really nice to see the personal stories kind of flesh, as I think of it, fleshing out what we kind of already know from statistics. I'd love to have a chat with you about methodology and how much of your, many of your findings really are coming from what you did with mass observation and how many you're using to illustrate things that we knew or could have known in other ways. I think that's a really interesting question. And it's lovely because it's also about changing discourses around social mobility, as well as about changes in social mobility. So for those of us, I don't think of myself as in the social mobility in industry. I love that coinage. Uh, I think Lee probably is in the social mobility industry, but uh, kind of the way in which we tell, the way in which people talk about social mobility, the way in which talk about social mobility has changed over time. I think is really itself fascinating. And the thing I like most about the book is this kind of scepticism about the value of social mobility. A lot of people write as if the point is we don't have enough social mobility. Oh, and by the way, we wouldn't want it anyway, even if we had it, because it's the wrong thing to be wanting. And I think you negotiate really well the kind of tension between this sense that kind of, we, if there's going to be inequality, we do want fairness in the way people reach their positions 
on the unequal ladder. But kind of that's not we ideally we wouldn't be that wouldn't be our focus in the first place because we wouldn't have the inequalities that uh, we're talking about people getting fair access to. Um, so I just like I really like the way you you did all that and uh, kind of what I want to do in my what's five minutes left is just make even more clear that I think there are three different kinds of things we could be worrying about in this area and I'm a lot of what I'm going to say is just really going to echo what Lee said so if you imagine society as a kind of you know a set of unequally advantaged positions now to call that a ladder is already to think of it as something people move up and down or as it were the point of a ladder is to move up or to move down you don't have to think of it that way at all there's if, if a more neutral description would just be the set of unequal positions. then we can ask three questions kinds of questions about that one is how are chances to reach the different rungs distributed what causes some people to be near the top what causes some people near the, to be near the bottom are the processes that kind of lead people to reach the different rungs fair and i think everybody knows they're not you know it, it, you know it's, it's not there aren't that many people out there saying oh you know what it's really fair out there and the people who get to the top deserve to be there and the people at the bottom you know i don't believe there's that many people who really kind of in, endorse that kind of view and the social mobility problematic is about that first that first question how, how are chances to move around this ladder um distributed and what are the processes and i'm quite heretical of that so i'm one of those people who think it's not fair if talented people get to the top any more than if untalented people get to the top i don't see why where you are on the ladder should depend on whether you happen to be talented or not um and i can't quite tell where you are where you are on, on that one from the book so the first question is about movement in the ladder second question as lee said is about how far apart are the rungs on the ladder uh, you know, how unequal is the society? Never mind how unequal the chances are moving, but how unequal are the positions between which they're moving? Um, and social mobility people rightly say that the extent of the gaps is going to affect how easy it is to move between. That's absolutely true. But even if there was no movement between them, we'd still worry about the extent of the gaps, or we ought to worry about the extent of the gaps. And we can ask really good questions about why are the gaps so big? You know, why? Why do we tolerate these kinds of vast inequalities? Uh, you know, even if there was perfect chances of movement between them, still there'd be a good question about how big the gaps are and why we should have them and what justifies them. And I think you're, you know, one of the main thrusts of your book is to kind of make that point in effect. I'm just putting in a different language, the, the kind of concern with equality rather than mobility. And then the third thing, which I actually think gets neglected by everybody in this debate, is you know, how bad is the bottom rung? How badly off do we allow people to be in our society? Because the people at the bottom of our society, they're not worrying about social mobility. They're not thinking it's not fair that I don't have the same chance as other people to move up the ladder. That is not kind of salient to them. And it's not really, their pro the problem they have is not that. It's not a lack of mobility. The problem is that they are living, you know, desperate lives and we allow them to do that. Um, and that kind of doesn't come through I, in, in your final in, in at the end of the book, what Selena does is have a whole set of kind of policy recommendations. Um, and what what struck me about that was how how I mean, and last, how few of them really were about social mobility as such. And how many of them were really about kind of addressing the problems of our society that really aren't particularly to do with social mobility. They're more to do with, you know, poverty and inequality. And that was kind of one of the main things I took from your book. Um, I've got one minute left, I think. So there's just the last thing. So I really like your point, which, which I agree with a lot about how, given the way we allow society to be, it's hard to criticize families for protecting their children from pursuing strategies that kind of preserve advantage for their children, because they're worried about downward mobility. And in particular, they're worried about um, you know their children having really very bad outcomes as the health service deteriorates you know even kind of lefties like me start to think well you know i i need to worry about how my kids and my grandkids are going to be 30 40 years down the road because we don't longer have we don't no longer going to have a proper welfare state to protect them but i do still think that it is appropriate sometimes to criticize people for hoarding opportunities so i don't think we can i don't think we should say look the individual is completely off the hook. It's all about the policies. It's all about the kind of way we allow society to be collectively. 
I think sometimes it is appropriate to object to people. And I'm thinking here about classic cases of kind of sending your kids to elite private schools, for example. I think there is still room for a kind of an individual level critique in some cases of people who are just hoarding opportunities in a way that they don't need to, to protect their own children's advantage and not to, um, you know, not, not to show a proper concern for the distribution of uh, uh, opportunities for all. Okay, that's me, thank you. Oh, that, was, that was brilliant as well. That was such excellent and varied uh, contributions from the panellists. And um, Selena, I'm going to come back to you just to get your reflections on that first, because that, that, was, that was incredibly rich from uh, different uh, contributors there. Any reflections on or responses to those? Yeah, um, thank you all so much. They're really thought provoking um, uh, uh, responses and very generous um, as well given all of your relevant expertise. And I guess, you know, just a, just a few things to pick up because I think they're so salient to the, to the wider discussion. Um, uh, Adam asked there about, you know, how many of these conclusions would we get from statistics rather than from uh, uh, personal testimonies and what's the role of each? And I think that is very important for policy debates going forward. And, and I guess that speaks absolutely to your point, Adam, about processes, about, Yes, I, I concur with a lot of what the statisticians have found. And one of my objectives was to try to think about um, uh, within that picture then, who does get opportunity and who does not? And how do, for example, racial discrimination and sex discrimination, how do those inequalities and, and or exploitative practices around them, um, how do they feed in to our understanding of, of who gets on and, and who is in the majority who who absolutely don't get to the top of the ladder. Um, and then in terms of um, the point that um, came from both Lee and Adam about, you know, how, how we think about um, different levels. Do we think about talent or intelligence or do we need to broaden those terms in some way to think about, about higher levels? And, and I guess I'm with you there really, Adam. I mean, I just think that, I think that there is something innately hierarchical about, about considering society being structured around social mobility. And so inevitably, that means that we begin to value some things more than others. And one of the things I try to look at in the book is how intelligence and talent become defined as certain skills um, and not defined as others. And rather, and I'm certainly not arguing that we need to, to rethink that to come up with a different hierarchy of skill I think what we need to, to think about is, is society in a much more organic way as, as a place and as a network of people who need many, many different skills. And we need to think about, you know, valuing diversity is such a kind of empty key phrase at the moment, but actually it's gonna be, it take really hard conceptual and practical work to properly value diversity and recognize that we really need diversity um, to get on. Um, in terms of occupation hoarding and opportunity hoarding, sorry. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I, 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 I'm incensed really at, at people who, who engage in those kinds of practices. I guess my objection is to those policymakers and members of the social mobility industry who just focus on that practice rather than also focusing on policymakers who just uphold the idea of these hierarchies, um, but then expect people to behave properly or say, well, people are just innately wanting, say, choice over their children's education. We can't do anything about that. When we all know that the state regulates in all kinds of ways and could quite properly regulate on that as well. Um, so it was just trying to draw attention to the state and to policymakers as well as to, as well as to those individuals. Um, I really appreciate the points about, about geography um, that came from Lee and also from Halima, who I think really drew our attention as well to the fact that we should be thinking about this more as a global issue. Very often it's talked about in terms of national education systems, national labour markets. One of the things that really struck me in my research about migrants was the way that very often, even those who do do well, and your point is well taken, Halima, that we're talking now about very specific um, minorities within very specific ethnic groups, um, are very often supporting not only their families, but also families or communities in other continents um, who need that support precisely because of the kind of economic and political inequalities that, that our governments um, sustain and foster. Um, and then just a couple of final points. I absolutely believe that you should be able to, to choose what you, Lee, called 
<clears throat> downward mobility. Of course, there used to be a kind of a, a slight quid pro quo in terms of thinking that if one wasn't, say, earning um, a top salary, one would in return get some kind of pension that was going to be worth something and a degree of security. And that quid pro quo no longer exists, which I think makes those, those decisions really difficult for people. And we should all worry about that, not just in terms of security, but also because one of the things that I found looking at the history is that people are more likely to innovate, which often does mean earning less for a while or living in a different way, um, in, in areas when there's a strong welfare state. And we know that if we look at Scandinavian countries as well. So if we're gonna innovate our way out of things like the climate crisis, we need people to have a safety net. And just returning to the point that Halima and, and Adam made at the end about the what's happening at the very lowest rungs, Yes, you know, my, my conclusion is very much that in the end, social mobility is a shy mirror, really, that, that really what we have to be doing is looking at, at, at the bottom rung and, and at what is going on there. Um, not least because we're talking about social mobility. One of the, yeah, I've, I've done books before on the working class, I've done books on other subjects. When we went to the mass observers, what was interesting was that many of them, and particularly those who were on low incomes, didn't have a clue what social mobility meant. It didn't speak to them at all or their experiences. And so for policymakers to keep harping on about it, I think to some extent suggests just how far they and their debates have got from the reality of most people's lives. Excellent, thank you. That was a brilliant response as well. And um, so I'm conscious of time and we've got so many great questions. I'm going to try and theme them a little bit, but there is probably, there's one just to put back, just because we were talking about opportunity hoarding. Um, if we can just put that one to you first, actually, uh, Selena directly is about, so it's very interesting to hear your observations about opportunity hoarding, feelings of insecurity, about the availability of opportunity causing people to pull up the ladder. Um, so did you find anything out, anything in the book that could help us figure out how to stop that happening, how you persuade people to keep those opportunities um, open for others? Uh, yeah, I think comprehensive education is a really great success story in this way. And I should say, you know, it, it, there's never a perfect answer, right? So I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, there's, there's any kind of golden ticket out of, out of this. But one of the really interesting things when you look at the 1970s and 1980s, when Britain pretty much got rid of selective secondary education, introduced comprehensive schools, is the massive take up and the massive popularity of those schools. And even when in the late 1980s, the Conservative government began to um, introduce a system where, where parents could exercise more choice over their schools, something which was then ramped up by New Labour in the 90s, um, it was the case that the vast majority of parents were still choosing to send their children to the local school. And we're talking about a very different era in terms of housing markets. So it wasn't the case that the wealthiest parents were always sending their kids. Of course, there were inequalities between schools. I'm not trying to argue that there weren't, but they were not necessarily sending their kids to a school which was private in all but name, right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the case that, you know, that, that we had the kind of huge uh, geographic segregation of income groups that we get now. Um, so really, the fact that you provide pretty well resourced education, the fact that you take pressure off children because they're not having to sit entrance exams and so on, most parents, most parents liked those things. And also the fact that you were in a labour market where there did appear to be quite a lot of opportunity. So you weren't having to think when your child was five or 11, how do I make sure that they get into a position where, as Adam said, they can afford healthcare or they are going to get into a professional job necessarily? So actually, when you provide universal great services, there's massive take up, you know, and just and just a PS on that. We saw that with the welfare state, you know, middle class take up of the National Health Service um, uh, was was far greater than the Labour government who, who were the architects of the NHS. Um, thought it would be, and it, and it was very quickly. People like universal services. Any specific reflections on opportunity holding yet? Yeah. Uh, I just me. add, Bobby, on, on this. Um, when I, I presented to uh, head teachers in Norway a couple of weeks ago, um, and I don't know if others are aware of this, but they, they have a law of Yanti in 
Norway and other Scandinavian countries. And it's really interesting. It's, it's a really well, it's really adhered to in the culture. And this is the idea of not putting yourself above others, that your actions shouldn't. And, and I, I'm not saying that would be easy to um, embrace in, in the UK, but it, it really made me reflect that we've bought into a very individualistic notion of success, i.e. the American dream. And yet the countries that have the highest social mobility rates are the Scandinavian countries. And by the way, not many people talk about social mobility in those countries. It's not really um, spoken about that much. So I just I just wanted to reflect on that. But, you know, during the pandemic, the early days of the pandemic, I felt that, that we were maybe getting into a bit more of a collective growth. But then it's been snapped away again, I feel. I feel we're, we've gone straight back. But anyway, it's just, it's just I, I love the law. Yeah. It, it, by the way, it, it emerged about the same time as the American dream, about 100 years ago, these mm -hmm. two ideas of how we judge yeah. success. Excellent. Yeah, no, really good. Great. So I'm going to um, try and theme these up a little bit because we've got quite a few, but there's certainly one about geography in mostly about um, national geography in, in the UK. And it's kind of maybe not surprising given the audience trying to relate it to the current policy environment. So there's a few questions. I'm going to throw these out uh, for every everyone and put them all up together. So uh, one uh, uh, participant asked, it would be just great to hear from the panelists view of the levelling up white paper and um, what policy measures from that are most likely to be helpful. Um, there's a question from Deirdre Henderson from Scottish Government saying, do you see any difference in the approaches to social mobility between the UK nations? And then reflecting a bit of a theme that we had in the discussion, um, uh, a question around how do you see social mobility enabling individuals to stay within their own town homes? Um, given the narrative is focused on movement away, assimilation um, into uh, from a typically less socially mobile area. So that sense of um, you have to move to get on. And I think we've touched on some of those themes, but it'd be great. So if um, we start maybe with Selena again, but just picking any any or all of um, those types of geographical themes and any reflections you've got. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll stick to the geographic themes because um, I know that there are there are others on the panel who are much more apprised of of, of policy um, than than I am. And I think, by the way, that there's room for both. Like, I think I think actually we really need the kind of policy oriented work that someone like Lee's doing. But I think that we also, I mean, this is also a bit of a plea for we also need the kind of research that that isn't tied to policy questions, you know, and increasingly in universities, we are constantly told, you know, that we have to show, you know, relevance, but we need blue skies thinking, because as I tried to suggest in the book, it's been those moments where people have innovated and done things differently, often for the better. Um, but in terms of in terms of geography, yeah, I did find differences um, in 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 attitudes to social mobility and experiences between between the UK nations. So one of the early chapters in the book looks at um, what happened in Scotland in the late 19th, 30, 20th century, where there was a bit more access to higher education than elsewhere in the UK, um, and a bit more access also to secondary education. Um, and that definitely uh, did feed into um, uh, certainly uh, some sections of Scottish society being able to get an education in a way that their counterparts in England um, were not, um, and also that being valued um, in certain ways that, that wasn't true south of the border. And that was partly about, about policy, um, and it was partly about um, a broader culture. Um, so it's interesting what happens when, you know, when those interact. And then in terms of, of, of geographic mobility, one of the striking things for me was um, both urban rural. So with the Scottish example, one of the things that was really striking there was that in order to really get into the professions or into senior white collar work, you were still having to move out of a largely rural country to say Edinburgh or Aberdeen um, uh, to, to get on, which of course, you know, brings lots of expense quite apart from distance from one's family and things like that. Um, you know, that was over a century ago, but we're back there, I think now. Um, we're in a situation where, as, as, as Lee, I think, mentioned, you know, Manchester, London, to some extent, Bristol are the places where lots of the, uh, the, the, the elite jobs are and lots of the professions are, are increasingly based. And, that, and that's a real problem, um, not just because of the kinds of costs that it brings for, for um, people outside of those areas, 
um, I was going to say young people, but you know, one of the problems with the debate about social mobility is it only focuses on young people. And one of the things we need to think about is how people who either arrive in Britain later in life or who want to change their lives a bit later in life are, are able to do that. And, and moving to a different city is often not possible when you've got a family and so on. Um, but also, you know, we're, we're, we're all the losers. So, you know, there's been some excellent research done on the, the way that there's been a massive decline in regional media. And what that's meant for the fact that local councils are not, are, not, are not accountable anymore and the fact that Westminster decisions and their impact at local level are not really being documented by journalists because journalists are coming through universities and the national papers as opposed to the kind of routes through regional newspapers and regional media that were there 50, 60 years ago. Great, thank you. And I, and I knew this would happen. We're running out of time. Um, on uh, to get through uh, more questions. So I'm going to come to the panel in turn, um, just to answer that point around levelling up in the geographic um, things, if you have things or any other final reflections before I give Selena um, the final words. So let's go in reverse order. Adam, have you anything on that geographical bit or anything else, just as a final thought? Uh, well, levelling up is a good idea, right? That, I mean, if, if what that means is raising the four, then that seems like what that's kind of what I was suggesting where it should be the focus. And certainly uh, there is a geographic dimension to kind of how well off or badly off people are. So, um, you know, as it were, the idea that what should happen is that the places where people are most badly off should be better off than they currently are so that things are more level. I'm all for that. Uh, the content of the policy and the likelihood of this government delivering that, um, I'm you know deeply skeptical about I, I mean i'll be honest i'm not you know i'm not an expert on the details of what exactly the policies are uh you know i'm just very mindful that we're talking about a kind of an attempt at something that looks like a progressive goal you know given a history of 20 years of retrenchment and austerity uh so anyway you know i'm not going to say anything that, that, that other people here don't know more about but leveling up kind of i think of that as in terms of my ladder, that's kind of trying to get the bottom rungs higher up and therefore reducing the gaps. That's exactly what we should be going for. And it's nothing to do with social mobility. That's my thought. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. Halima. Leveling up. Um, I, I often find that if you pick phrases, they're often for a particular purpose, probably to build political support for some work. But if we mean creating more jobs in different parts of the country, or increasing access for education for um, those at the bottom quintile, that's a very good thing. And there are proven um, ways to do so. So I, I tend not to like phrases because I think that can be quite confusing. Um, one of the comments I wanted to kind of leave with uh, before we left was um, around um, tomorrow's proposals to introduce minimum requirements um, for maths and English uh, for students higher, uh, in higher education for student loans is, you know, I mean, and this is what worries us despite the discourse around levelling up, there are proposals going through that actually take away from social mobility. Now, whatever you think about social mobility, whether you think it's a discourse that only the middle classes have, it is not a bad discourse. The point is that there are practical measures and bills that are put forward by government at the moment that's actually taken away and negating the fabric of what would be uh, social mobility. So that worries me. Leveling up, it's empty unless you have some actions that do create jobs or do create opportunity. That's brilliant. I'm so glad you brought that up, Halima, because that was the other big theme that I hope to get to, certainly from people's questions, a lot of concern about that. So that's um, great to cover that. Lee? Yeah, I, I think I won't talk about levelling up. We're running out of time. I, mean, I think the one thing that I've been dwelling on with my own research and sort of relates to what Selena said as well, it is just the power of family. And, you know, when we do these statistical studies, it's often underestimated how much uh, the home environment shapes uh, outcomes. And, and it just, it's, I suppose, a plea for us to think more about that. And you, you don't want to get into these sort of deficit models. That's the thing. You don't, you don't want to sort of tell all these other parents to do what other middle class parents do. So, I, but, but there are issues around just having uh, a, a, an environment for young young people wherever they come from that they can develop as human beings and, and at the moment that isn't happening for many uh, many homes in the country so so that that's the thing that I'm really 
sort of thinking about a lot with the social mobility studies at the moment and we, so we, de- we tend to not get into involved in those debates it's just a a, a, a last thought for you all really good really good thank you so much selena any final words before i wrap up yeah i think i'll just say really briefly what would happen if we said the big question to think about is how do we create an equal society rather than how do we improve social mobility i think i think that's what we need to we need to ask and actually we you know maybe we can't achieve that completely but one of the things history shows is that things can change really rapidly and they don't usually do so as a result of government Thank you. That's uh, uplifting, forward-looking um, note to end on. So before giving my final thanks, um, I just wanted to flag that this is the third in the series that we're running uh, on uh, interrelated topics with the Fairness Foundation. Um, so our next event is with Manoush Shafiq uh, on her great book, uh, What We Owe Each Other, New Social Contract. That's the 31st of March. Um, a lunchtime, just another quick hour session there. Um, so just left me to thank um, all the attendees for coming. Great turnout today. Um, the teams at the Policy Institute and the Fairness Foundation for setting this up, particularly Will Snell uh, there uh, for putting all this together. Our excellent panel, really, really, really rich contributions. And of course, finally, to Selena. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everyone.